joining us for the webinar today. If you are just joining us via audio on your telephone, please mute your telephone. For those of you who are joining us via Skype, you will be muted at the end of the webinar. We will open up for questions and answers. At that time, if you press star six on your phone, you may ask a question. If you have questions during the webinar or slides in particular, please type them in the chat question area and I will answer them as best I can. Otherwise, we will hold them for the end of the webinar and talk about all the questions at that point. Right now, I'd like to introduce Chris Cooney of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. So good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chris Cooney with the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. Uh, welcome to this COVID-19 recovery call. Uh, we're delighted to have more than 100 people registered for this meeting. And I would ask you, if you're calling in, to mute your phones so that everyone can hear properly. At the end, we will unmute and allow for your questions and answers. Uh, we expect this call to go about an hour. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Uh, we're extremely uh, fortunate uh, to have this technology, to have the partners that we have, as well as our staff working from home, like you. Probably many of you are either at home or working uh, on a skeleton crew. And uh, I want to acknowledge in particular uh, Lexi Reinertsen and Emma Stratton, who promoted this and, and put it together. Uh, I also want to thank our partners, and you're going to hear from them uh, shortly. We're very fortunate to have, as partners in this recovery, uh, local, state, and federal resources. And you're going to hear from them, and we plan on this being recorded and uh, placed on the Chamber's website, which is an extraordinary collection of uh, best practices and uh, resources that are available. That's at www.metrosouthchamber.com. Uh, you can check that out again for this video, uh, replays, and there's other videos that are, are being joined onto that site on a regular basis as well as resources. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the mayor uh, of Brockton. I believe he's on and he's either calling in or, or uh, has uh, voice uh, capabilities. I'm going to ask Eli just to confirm that and, and get that going. But uh, I just want to introduce him. Um, you know, he's been in this office probably about 100 days. Uh, he is facing uh, this situation uh, head on. Uh, we're fortunate to have a guy like this who has the education uh, and the experience. Uh, he's got, uh, you know, several degrees and uh, 14 years serving on the city council. He's born and raised in the city uh, along with his wife and their three, three children are here. His wife is in the medical services. Uh, between the two of them, they're both on the front lines of this uh, facing COVID-19 and also the recovery. Uh, Mayor, if you're able to uh, now link in, uh, welcome. Thank you, Chris, and I want to first of all thank you and, and your colleagues uh, and your team at the Metro South Chamber of Commerce for uh, for really spearheading this in conjunction. And I want to thank the Small Business Administration, SBA, um, for the United States. I mean, this is, uh, as we know, unprecedented times, uncharted waters, uh, direct uh, direct negative impacts to uh, the city of Brockton from a financial component. Uh, relative to the, uh, the small and medium-sized businesses. But, um, you know, I, I, as the mayor of Brockton, uh, you know, I just want to be clear that I'm committed to business. I've always been committed to business. I have a small business myself as a practicing attorney. Uh, but I understand right now, um, you know, the number one priority is to stay healthy. Uh, and what I've been saying, and I am joined right now in my office at City Hall, uh, social distancing of, of six feet right now, but I do have my chief of staff, uh, Kerry Richards, my uh, Director of Constituent Services, John Messia, uh, the esteemed John McGarry, who is uh, the Health Officer for the Board of Health of the City of Brockton, and Mr. Steve Hook, who is the Executive Director of BEAM of Brockton Emergency Management. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we're going to get through this together. The key word is together. Um, but we need to practice exactly what the healthcare professionals are telling us what to do, right? We need to stay healthy, and then we can figure out how we're going to help the businesses recover during this uh, this health crisis, this pandemic. As a mayor of the city of Brockton, uh, you know, I'm on regular conference calls with, uh, with Chris Cooney and the Metro South Chamber of Commerce, also the Downtown Business uh, Association led by John Marion, uh, the uh, Camp Hello Business Association led by Ron Bethany, and the Montello Business Association led 
by Scott Dwyer. Um, we are in this together, and I mean that, and I want to thank our partners at the SBA, because at the end of the day, when the dust settles and, and we get back to whatever they call normalcy and, uh, and this virus subsides, uh, we're going to need to come together in a collaborative fashion, uh, working with the state delegation here in the Commonwealth. We have wonderful representatives, three reps that serve Brockton, one state senator serves Brockton. Congressman Stephen Lynch has been a great partner, uh, and he'll continue to do so during this time and, and thereafter. And, of course, we have United States Senator Ed, Ed Markey calling me and, and Elizabeth Warren calling me as well. But really what people are looking for, uh, first of all, is information. And the information is going to be shared vis-a-vis uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the Mayor, all the uh, local associations that I declared, and also SBA. And I will tell you that to work with the state and federal delegation is really uh, going to be at the core of our success as we turn this around and we recover. Um, but at the end of the day, what we have in the city of Brockton, and I, if for those that don't know Brockton, we're called the City of Champions, and we'll call that for many reasons. But I'll tell you, it's the hardworking people that every day go to work to better the lives of Brocktonians, people that live here, work here, and their families. And right now, all I can say is you have a friend at City Hall. I'm going to continue to work with you and for you. And I look forward to uh, the end of this where we have the Q&A session, and I'll be here, um, and I am here. Uh, anytime people want to come to City Hall, we're closed to the general public, but you can call me, 508-580-7123. And, of course, you can always visit the city's website, which is www.brockton.ma.us. With that being said, I look forward to this hour of conversation. It's going to be fruitful and informative. And, again, I thank the Metro South and SBA for your time and your efforts as we move forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, state partners who I know were on a call at 1 o'clock with Lieutenant Governor and uh, the Secretary of Economic Development and Housing, uh, Keneally, Mike Keneally. Uh, I know they were jumping off that call onto this one. I'm hoping that they're live. We think that they are. Uh, the, the two great partners, uh, they are, I'm going to give you a little background on them. Sue Whitaker uh, joined the staff this past year of the Mass Office of Business Development. Uh, she has an expertise in uh, workforce development and uh, mass hire uh, programs. I know uh, many of you have asked questions about uh, work share. Uh, and uh, she is on the call, and uh, I'm going to say a few words, and then I'm going to introduce Margaret as well. So. Thanks so much, Chris. I appreciate that. And um, I do have um, experience with work share and would be very happy to answer any and all questions related to that. Um, and we're here for businesses. We were just on a call and getting the latest and greatest updates, and we'll continue to keep you informed um, so that you can continue to keep your constituents informed as well. So thank you so much for having us here today. Right, and that, that work share uh, information is on our site as well as yours. So uh, that allows employers to possibly allow people to work uh, part-time and then collect unemployment part-time as well, correct? It does. You can reduce the hours between a minimum of 10% and 60% of the work week, and then the rest of the time they would be on unemployment insurance. And... Um, all that information is, is up on the website, or you can go to www.mass.gov slash workshare. And there's a, a really great video that kind of walks you through how to apply for workshare. And it's pretty straightforward. It's through unemployment insurance. So um, it's a great program. It keeps your workforce in place so that when this pandemic is over, business goes back to the usual and you haven't lost any of your workforce. That's terrific. And Susan, I know you're available also via... Uh, email and, and calls. I know you've been a, a real presence in Brockton and the surrounding towns uh, since you've arrived, and uh, we really appreciate that. In addition, right around the same time, Margaret uh, LaForest uh, joined you. She's an expert in all of the financial programs that are available through the state, uh, both before COVID and, and now uh, moving forward. Uh, she also was on that call, I believe, with the secretary, and uh, she is a former city councilor from the city of Quincy, and again, services this area for helping uh, small business. We've had both of you out recently uh, at, at several uh, tours of companies in the area, uh, as well as uh, meeting with small business owners and developers uh, in the city and the surrounding towns. So, uh, Margaret, welcome. Uh, can we unmute Margaret? 
Uh, I believe Margaret's line is unmuted. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Great. Thank you, Chris. You know, it's been a trying time for all of us, and I just want to send the message that sincerely we're sharing and understanding these financial hardships the COVID crisis is bringing and so many of your area businesses are experiencing. And I think it's important for the greater Brockton area to know that the Commonwealth is here to help. While Sue and I have different backgrounds, we are both here as a resource in the same role, whether it's work share, financial programs, and really our role is to help your companies navigate the Commonwealth's program. So we are to be here, and you know, if you have a question of something that's pending, by all means, give us an email, and I'll, I'll put my email as well as my phone into the chat window. And I, we really welcome you to reach out to us because if you're reaching out to a state program and you're looking for an answer, if we don't have it, we're going to help you find it. So please, to, you know, we, we welcome you to contact us. And Chris, to you and to Lexi and Emma, what a team that you have, and to, for the Brockton community to know what a strong leadership and business partner you are. You know, I know you've been on most of the calls with us um, and Lieutenant Governor Polito and Secretary Keneally, and I just want to express their gratitude because you have forwarded out, you know, every communication, and we understand things are coming fast and frequent, and it's a very fluid situation, and you've been a very strong partner to us, so we're grateful for that. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, you know, one of the questions we get repeatedly now is the governor had announced a $10 million grant for small businesses, or let me take that back, say loan for small businesses uh, up to 75000 My understanding is that those funds were exhausted almost immediately, but there may be another round being considered. So there was a hundred thirty-eight million. Uh, was it a hundred thirty-eight million worth of requests? So it was outrageous response from the small business community, and the Baker administration had plugged to that program in because it was. We knew we needed to get working capital in the hands of our com companies fast. And so Mass Growth Capital and the partnership with Mass Development stepped up. So what you had heard, it initially was funded with $10 million. It was additionally capitalized with another $10 million for a total of $20 million. Um, some of those loans are going out in process in that now that the SBA, that Massachusetts has been declared eligible, we're really directing everybody into the SBA loan program. I do have some other updates um, from the Secretary Keneally call for you. Um, one. Yeah, one that we've, you know, been hearing a lot of ask for the restaurant communities. I know everyone's really trying to support the hospitality industry has been just hit so hard. You're hearing on the news about the beer and wine, of, you know, delivery from the restaurants. That's something that is still pending approval. Um, hot off the press we just talked about in the last call, and you'll get some information. And as soon as I have, you know, in writing, um, I think actually just got a COVID text message. There's a the um, state is doing a COVID. It's I'll text out the number in the chat when I'm done here. Um, you can get text messages from the state with the updates, and so they just sent out via that channel this uh, travel advisory for incoming into Massachusetts. And I've had some questions about how does that affect our suppliers, you know, coming in and providing us. So um, I know people are going to be looking for guidance, so stay tuned on that. Just to clarify, is that people or product? Uh, so I, I believe it's people, and I think it was more, uh, you know, some of the hot spot areas like Florida, like New York, New Jersey. I think what the ask is, and it's an advisory, not an order, but if you are returning from one of these hot spot areas to self quarantine for 14 days. Okay. Uh, on the um, labor and workforce development side of that call, Secretary Acosta was there. And one question I've had as a trending question is about the unemployment insurance rate. So when we get out the other side, businesses who were not in a position that they needed to close but because of the COVID crisis had to lay off employees are concerned about what the insurance rates are going to be moving forward. And, you know, that's a, a double hit for them. So January is when that gets reset for the year. And Secretary Costa assures us that that is something that's being worked on. So because it's not, you know, time, um, time, particularly time sensitive, there's a little bit more time to work that out. It is something that's in the pipeline to be reviewed, but understand they recognize they have until January to figure that one out. 
um, the essential business list is it something that has been getting a lot of uh, questions. So the Who's essential, right? Right. So Secretary Keneally's office, and I can send that link to you in the chat window. Um, let me just write myself a note on that. Uh, for the essentials list and also the essentials FAQ list. This is being updated daily. Sue and I were part of the team that was reviewing the inquiries coming in. Um, and just to know, these emails aren't going to be responded to um, individually. We're up to over 7,000 inquiries for clarification. And so to just understand, we are asking companies to review the guidance, review the FAQs, and then to interpret it from that. If they the company reviews the guidance and sees themselves as able to operate, we are you know, letting you know you're able to go and operate. There's nothing that you need to do. People have asked if they need a permit, if they need to let their municipality know if there's anything actionable, and we're saying no, you're able to proceed on that. Okay. And uh, the last resource I just saw in the same text that came out, and I'm sure I'll be getting this info to you, I thought was an interesting resource with the health care concerns. Um, the Commonwealth has partnered with Bowie Healthcare on an online resource that allows the residents to check their symptoms and connect you with the next appropriate health care resource. So I think that's interesting to see the telehealth uh, developments that are coming out and coming into play. And, you know, I think it's just so important that, our first responder communities and what we can, you know, whether we want to limit who's heading into the hospitals, if we're able to make response uh, with this telehealth or other programs, you know, really um, practicing that safe distancing and utilizing some of the technologies that are available to us to, you know, serve both the, um, the personal community. Okay. One of the clarifications we got in just in general terms, because I know there are 2,600 requests for uh, definition, a clear definition of essential. But if you're in support, if you're in a business in support of health care, food, or safety, uh, you don't actually have to be doing that. But if you're producing a product or supporting uh, those uh, industries, then it's likely that you will uh, get approval uh, to continue to be considered as essential. Um, so some good examples along those lines. But at, while we're on this topic, uh, just two quick things. Um, well, one, I guess one, and I'll say one from the mayor, is masks and shields. We, we've, I was on the phone last night with uh, Sue Joss from the Brockton Neighborhood Health Center, uh, as well as Kim Holland, uh, president of uh, Brockton Hospital. I know uh, the mayor is, uh, has served on the board for many, many years of Good Samaritan and has been in contact uh, with Marcella, the president there. Uh, they are in need of uh, these masks and shields. So I know there's a lot of energy around this, but they, they were asking if uh, hair salon or body shop or uh, construction folks, uh, if they got an extra case of them or uh, even three or four that you don't think you're going to use during this uh, time frame, because we think that the capacity will be up by, you know, within 30 days. But right now, uh, they're in need of them. So, folks, if you have any of those, please get in touch with us and we'll forward your information on to those uh, health care providers. So we're delighted to have with us um, uh, the Small Business Administration. As many of you know, uh, Congress has been debating a $2 trillion package. They've approved some emergency uh, funds, which we're going to hear about. Uh, we expect that a vote will happen either today or over the weekend, hopefully no later than Monday uh, on the House side, uh, because the House has to approve it. The Senate's already approved it. And then that uh, $2 trillion uh, stimulus for uh, COVID-19 recovery will hopefully be approved and, and um, there'll be updates to what you're hearing today. But uh, I think some of what you're hearing today is new from even yesterday. Uh, so we're delighted again to have uh, as our partners the Small Business Administration. As I said to Bob Nelson, I don't think there's a team that's working harder uh, or has worked harder uh, for the businesses uh, in this, uh, this situation. Uh, we've we've uh, got Susan Laurie, our local rep, who uh, is our partner at, at our location right downtown in, in uh, Brockton, and she helped put together this this program. Uh, and additionally, we have um, uh, Bob Nelson, who's our uh, state director, uh, who's been on site uh, quite a bit. 
Um, and, you know, it's my pleasure at this point to turn this over to Eli Speu, uh, who has, uh, many of you may know if you're in the banking industry, has years and years of experience in um, banking, credit unions, uh, commercial lending, uh, and joined the SBA about five years ago. Uh, he has 150 lenders that uh, he is a liaison uh, to and from uh, the SBA and has uh, been uh, really a, a wonderful resource for us to put this together. And he's got some great information for small businesses looking to uh, get uh, in the queue uh, to, for consideration for uh, financing. I uh, just want to give you an update. I know many of you told me that the SBA website was down. Uh, last I checked, it's back up. It has a paper application. We're hoping that that will be turned into an electronic application uh, before too long. Anyway, let me uh, uh, bug out here and uh, turn this over to Eli. Eli? All righty. Well, Chris, thank you very much. You know, greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak to your members, the constituents. You know, um, I, I greatly appreciate, you know, the work you and your team are doing. Uh, the SBA is here to help, you know, you, your members, all small businesses throughout the state. I definitely want to echo the words that the mayor shared with all of us. And, uh, you know, cannot stress enough, social distancing, you know, uh, proper hygiene. And uh, like, like many of you, you know, we're all, uh, from the SBA point of view, we're all working from home, uh, trying to work remotely as much as we can and, uh, you know, just, just taking the proper precautions. So uh, another thing I do want to echo from what the mayor said is, you know, we're in this together, you know, we're here for one another and we'll make it through this together, you know, so I think I think that's the, that's the common thread. And uh, I, I just want to, uh, Chris, you alluded to a couple of the, um, you know, a couple of, of the changes that are going on now in Congress. Uh, this call, I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same page. This call is not going to direct any of those questions, okay? It is a little premature um, for us at the agency to, to basically be talking about something that is proposed legislation, okay? So um, we're, we're hoping and we know that Congress is working diligently to get that done, to get it done sooner rather than later. Um, but. We at the agency have the responsibility to deploy $350 billion of that, of that package to small businesses. So the good news is that, you know, there's more help coming your way. Um, you know, uh, we are going to make sure that we get the details out to you as soon as they're available. We want to make sure that, you know, we get it right the first time and that, you know, there's not going to be hearsay, you know, um, from us, at least from the district level. So that doesn't mean that you should not stay up to date with what's going on, with the changes proposed, with, you know, um, any anything that you hear, you know, from the state le level, from your, you know, uh, um, congressmen and women and, and uh, you know, our senators who, who truly are doing remarkable work considering the gravity of, of, of the circumstances. So uh, quickly on this on this first slide, and, and I know we've got limited time, so I'm going to try to, to keep this this conversation focused on the economic injury disaster loan program. So it's one of two pro programs available to the SBA. It is by far the best thing we've got. Okay, and that's why I, I do want to keep the conversation focused on this program. So here in Massachusetts, there may be uh, businesses, uh, perhaps some in the audience, who may have qualified uh, or who may have had a, a disaster loan in, in years past. Um, the administrator, uh, Jovita Carranza, made sure that all those existing disaster loans have a deferment until the end of this year, so December of 2020. Okay, in addition, all new economic injury loans that get approved as a result of the COVID-19 will have a 12-month um, deferral period, okay, right off the bat, you know, upon approval. So from the, the date that you as a small business owner, you, when you get approved, you sign the promissory note, you don't have to worry about a payment on that loan for the next year. Okay, so we're hoping that that's going to help with cash flow issues. We're going to... You know, we're hoping that that's not going to be a worry for you for the, the immediate future and, you know, the next 12 months, okay? But in addition, uh, this product does have, have a 30-year repayment period, no prepayment penalties of any kind. 
and no fees whatsoever. So I do want to stress that. I want to stress that because, you know, we are hearing from people who are trying to take advantage of the situation and they're, you know, they're looking to to basically uh, package these loans and, and charging small businesses in, in, in dire need for uh, a program that should be free to all of us. So what businesses are eligible to apply for this program? So first and foremost, you know, everyone in Massachusetts, okay, every small business in Massachusetts should apply. Okay, that is what, what I, I want you all to keep in mind. About 99% of businesses in Massachusetts are eligible by size standards, okay? Um, whether it's number of employees or gross revenues, that depends on, on, on your next code, on the industry you operate in. But um, you want to keep in mind that this loan, this particular you know, economic injury disaster loan, it, it is meant to provide working capital needs. So it's, a, it's an equity injection into your business for operating needs only. Okay, so, what, um, so for the most part, um, any, anything that's related to fixed expenses, um, debt payments, mortgages, leases, uh, payroll, accounts payable, things of that nature, uh, they need to be basically included in your working capital. So those needs are going to be funded. Those needs are going to be funded for perhaps the next four to six months. So that's going to be the ballpark of what the loan size is going to look like. Okay. Now, something to keep in mind is this application process, and I'm going to go briefly over, over that, um, does not have a box on the loan application where you say, I need 250000 or I need 500000 okay? Although the loan goes up all the way up to $2 million, that is not, you know, an available uh, feature of the loan. So your documentation and historical data is what, what the loan specialist is going to utilize to analyze your working capital needs. So on this slide, pretty self-explanatory. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind here is with our traditional programs, nonprofits do not qualify for SBA assistance. We are taxpayer funded. For this program, private nonprofit organizations may qualify. Um, just moving on, uh, again, a lot of this information is pretty self-explanatory, but I just want to hit the highlights of the, of the program and, and give you, uh, you know, some useful information for today. So we are, this is a loan program, it's not a grant, right, so there's no loan forgiveness with the Economic Injury Disaster Loan uh, Program. So we are a cash flow lender, uh, just like your bank and credit union, and uh, we're going to look at repayment ability of the business. Now, mind you, we're only going to look at historical data. So the current crisis, your current financials, you know, uh, the slowdown, the lack of revenues, that, that's not going to affect the, the decision on the loans. However, your credit history might, and it will. So. Although we do not have a published personal FICO score, um, this particular program does have a platform, which is um, it auto decisions loans based on an algorithm. So what I mean by it is if you have credit that's below average, chances are it's going to automatically be denied. So what we want you to do, if you think that that's, you know, uh, that's an issue that you're currently experiencing with your personal credit, um, we highly recommend you work with our resource partners. Um, make sure that, you know, uh, you take a couple of steps to improve your credit quickly and bef before applying, okay? So that's one of the things that I do want to caution you on. Um, another very important, you know, uh, aspect of this loan is, is what we call the credit available elsewhere. So not every business is going to qualify and, um, you know, get an economic injury loan, disaster loan. So uh, keep in mind, if you do have available credit elsewhere, whether it's your primary bank has a line of credit, you know, for working capital needs, let's say for $350,000 and, and you have it all available, and based on the analysis that we do on your historical data, 
we come up with, let's say, working capital needs of $200,000 for the next four to six months. Do you have $350,000 available? That means that you have credit available elsewhere. So it is unfortunate um, because I, I, I do know that the need is, is great. Uh, however, that is something that's mandated by Congress uh, with our program. You know, uh, it does truly take an act of Congress to change anything. So uh, unless Congress does something with this bill that's in the works, you know, that's going to be the case. Okay. Now, same thing with um, personal guarantees. Okay. So personal guarantees are also a, a must for anyone, any owner, 20% or greater owner in the business. Okay, so I'll talk. I'll talk about that in, in, in just a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, the maximum loan amount that, that any small business can qualify for is up to two million dollars. Okay, so um, if a business has currently a disaster loan from a previous, you know, disaster, declared disaster, whether it's a hurricane, a tornado, you know, the the a marathon bombing disaster we had in, in here in Massachusetts. For this declared disaster, the COVID-19, you know, um, you are eligible for up to two million dollars, and that's not aggregated with any previous loans. Okay. As far as interest rates, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that's one of the, the beauties of, of, of this program. The rate is extremely low um, in the commercial lending world. You know, this is free money. For for-profit businesses, the rate is fixed for the entirety, the, the duration of the loan of 30 years, at 3.75%. Now, it, it's, it's still a loan, right? So it's still interest you have to pay, but I think, you know, the deferment uh, period of 12 months makes a big difference. Uh, Nonprofits, those who qualify, they do get a reduced rate. Um, so they, uh, their rate would be 2.75%. Now, as, as far as size standard goes, again, there is there is a calculation that goes along with that. I, I wouldn't worry too much. About 99% of businesses do qualify. So, but uh, important again, and I do want to stress this part: uh, this funds are only for working capital needs. Okay, you cannot use this this um, this program to replace you know lost pro lost profits and sales business expansion, a new line, a uh, new product, whatever the case may be, okay? Um, whether it's, you know, even if, if it means that it's going to improve your business, even if it means that it's going to improve your current situation, that is not the intent of the, of the program. So as far as collateral goes, uh, it is written in the statute for the SBA that um, if collateral is not available to fully secure the loan, then that is no reason for us to deny the loan request. So say um, you're, based on, on our analysis, your, your loan amount should be $200,000. However, you're a service business, you've got very limited collateral, you've got $20,000 worth of collateral. We will take a lien on it, okay? But the, the loan does not need to be, you know, fully secured. So you will get approved even if you don't have sufficient collateral. It doesn't mean, however, that you don't have to pledge additional collateral. If additional collateral is available, that needs to be pledged. Um, now, if the loan is under $25,000, that can be completely unsecured. Okay, so no, not even a UCC filing on your business. I did mention earlier, this is a question we get often, 20% um, or greater owners will need to provide a personal unlimited guarantee. All right, so moving on, um, I, I'm sure you have lots of questions. Please make sure that you, you type in your questions on the chat box. I want to allow us enough time. I want to go through the slides. I want to allow us enough time to go through, you know, some of the questions or the most relevant questions if we can. So again, the goal is to, 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 to end this at three. So what makes this program so unique is the fact that this is our taxpayer dollars at work. This is directly funded from the U.S. Treasury. We, the SBA, the agency, we become a, the lender of last resort in cases like this. So whenever there is a declared disaster, you know, 
banks and, and credit unions are, are not really willing to lend, so the government become, becomes a lender of last resort. Uh, just want to stress here quickly, absolutely no cost to apply. If anyone is telling you you need to pay XYZ for an economic injury loan, okay, then you just find someone else. Uh, there shouldn't be any fees. There's no fees to package these loans. These are all free to you, okay? And the services to our resource partners are also free to all of you. So we work with SCORE. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Uh, the small business development centers throughout the state. And we work with the Center for Women in Enterprise. Uh, the Veteran Business Outreach Center is housed within the CWE, the Center for Women in Enterprise, another great resource for veteran-owned businesses. All right, so um, one thing you know that I forgot to mention, unlike most of our traditional SBA products, you do not need a bank you know, to get an economic injury loan. This next slide is self-explanatory. Um, there's a few businesses that are inel ineligible, and it's a short list, which is good. So charitable, religious organizations, agricultural enterprises, just because we have a sister agency that takes care of them, you know, are automatically ineligible for, you know, SBA assistance here. So how to apply? Pretty basic. So Chris mentioned um, earlier on the call that the electronic application system is no longer available, effective yesterday. The reason being is you can only imagine there's 29 million businesses in the U.S. Uh, all 50 states are declared disasters. So we're getting thousands of applications on an hourly basis. Our system was, you know, was not designed for that sort of volume. So we are getting... He's affected by this. I'm going to have him do that one. So uh, if we could please help you guys need your devices. Please make sure you mute your telephone. Uh, that's great. So um, thank you for that. So again, the portal, the disaster loan assistance portal is up and running. Um, they basically broke down the, the, the site for 24 hours. They made sure that all the documents that had already been submitted, they were, that were on our server, got transferred. Then you know, instead of now having a application, you know, um, that's done online, we had instead, you know, uh, now we're offering paper forms. Okay, so I'll, I'll go briefly over this. Um, yes, I, uh, I I understand that it, it may not be as um, you know as, as easy on the on the end user uh, side, but this works and it works well for the time being. So uh, the portal looks the same as it did before. Um, you you don't have the ability to check the application status if you did already submit a loan in. Okay, so uh, by double clicking on the apply online, basically. You're just going to see um, this page. So it's really a two-step process. Um, first and foremost, you know, some information, instructions to apply. Um, all the forms are listed here. So now they're paper format, PDF format. Just fill out the information as best you can. Uh, make sure that you know you sign the forms that need to be signed. You date it. You check the certification boxes. Um, just upload everything back, you know, just scan it back into your computer. Then there is an upload function on the same page. So you just upload the entire file, hit the submit button, um, then you get a confirmation right away. So it, it really is that simple, okay? Um, it, it's a little different than, than obviously what, what it was before. Um, maybe a little more challenging for some people. But again, I, I cannot stress enough that, you know, we do help, have help available, you know, through our resource partners. And obviously, you know, through the district office level, you know, we can, we can provide some, some additional assistance there. Uh, this is, this uh, slide is more of a checklist um, for all of you out there, if you haven't already submitted a, a loan application through. So uh, form five is the, the loan application. 
If you're a sole proprietorship, then Form 5C is what's required. Um, there is basically a size determination form that's Office of Disaster Assistance form. That's P019. Again, these are all live links. If you don't have a copy of the presentation, um, make sure that you reach out to Lexi at, at the chamber. She does have a copy of it, and all the uh, links are are basically live on, on, on this presentation. So they'll take you to the forms. You can use the slide basically to uh, as a checklist before you submit everything. But make sure that you do sign all the required forms. Um, make sure that you upload them. You know where they are in the system. And uh, once you get a confirmation number, that's your application number. That tells you you're good to go. Yeah. So a couple of best practices real quick here. I uh, just want to make sure that... You know, everybody's aware um, the biggest delays, first and foremost, are from missing information. Okay, this loan program is designed to provide you uh, anywhere between, you know, four to six months of working capital needs. Okay, but if you're offered more funds than you need, obviously you can request, you know, the loan amount to be lowered. If the loan officer has not calculated your working capital needs properly, all you need to send is additional, you know, information. Okay, so um, for those who may be automatically denied, whether for credit elsewhere or for uh, low credit scores, you do have up to six months to submit a reconsideration. Quickly, just wanted to give you, you know, uh, an overview of what the forms look like. So Form 5 is a two-page document, pretty easy, self-explanatory. You want to make sure that on question one, you only check, you know, the box that says economic injury loan. The applicant is the business. The principal information is further down on the form. There are certain disclosures here on, on page two of form five. Just pay close attention to it. If you had federal loans in the past, whether it's SBA, USDA, VA, FHA, um, student debt of, you know, federally guaranteed student debt loans, make sure that that's in the form, uh, you answer the, the form properly. And then, you know, moving on with the application, again, that form 19 is very easy, very self-explanatory, you know, um, you need to sign and date, you know, once you've entered the information about the gross revenues, size standards, you know, uh, same thing with the form 45 or 60, uh, a couple of Best practices with 45060 is you want you don't want to have your taxes, your 2018 or 2019 taxes, if they're ready, of course, um, in front of you so you can match the information exactly as it's filed with the IRS. So this is an IRS form, the one on the right here on the screen. Um, if, if, let's say, your name on the personal tax returns has the middle initial in it, if you don't enter it here, it's going to be rejected, okay? Uh, if your corporation is basically, if you're incorporated and uh, that is abbreviated on taxes, you, that's how you have to have it here, okay? Uh, there is a couple of boxes you got to check at the bottom right above your signature. Make okay, sure that's checked. If you file joint returns, both spouses need to sign, okay? The IRS will reject it. So, be truthful with the information you're providing. The personal financial statement is required for 20% or greater owners on the business. Okay, and that needs to be signed jointly if you're married. Uh, so, assets of 20% owners, uh, spouses, and minor children would need to be, you know, disclosed. So, with that said, I know that's a lot of information to go through in, in a short period of time, um, but. Definitely appreciate, you know, uh, you guys joining us, and I'm going to open it up to questions. So, uh, Eli, thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, overview. Uh, really extraordinary. You know, I, I know you mentioned both uh, for-profit and uh, not-for-profit and how they would have different rates. Uh, we have many nonprofits in the region that could also be made available. Uh, this could be made available to. Uh, of course, I had somebody email me saying uh, we're all nonprofits as businesses right now because there's no revenue coming in. Uh, but we understand uh, that people should apply. They should go through this process. If they have any idea, they think uh, that they might need some cash flow, 
and have access not only to this program, but to the programs that are coming on Monday, once Congress and the President uh, complete this $2 trillion. Go on, fill out the application. It'll get your mind and your inventory and your uh, checklist uh, ahead uh, of others uh, who are just going to start to work on this uh, next week or the week after. You also might be surprised that you may uh, not qualify for one item or one project, but one that's about to be approved this weekend uh, may uh, be of more interest to you or you may qualify for. So we're telling our, our small business owners, apply. It can't hurt to apply. Um, our bankers have been reaching out to us, telling us if you're a small business and you think you're going to have a problem before uh, September with cash flow, reach out to those commercial bankers those representatives, and let them know you might have a problem or you think you might have a problem if this thing goes on longer than so many weeks. That way they can begin to put you in the queue and prepare to have you uh, have a discussion with you about what what's going to work for you. And again, that kind of puts you at the front of the line. So uh, we're encouraging our, our small businesses to do that. And then lastly, we're also uh, giving them a warning. Do not uh, reply to scams that are telling you you need to pay them a certain amount of money to apply or any of that. Uh, as you just saw uh, Eli lay out for you in a very uh, good way, a very easy to understand way, is you can work yourself through these applications pretty much uh, on your own. Um, if you need help, reach out to us. We do have folks that are available that will walk uh, through the application uh, with you as well, some volunteers and some SCORE folks. Um, so uh, I, I guess we can open up for questions. I did have a question that came in in regard to the mayor, and it was regarding uh, if, if a resident of the region, because most of the, all the medical facilities are here in the city, if they're not feeling well and they think they have uh, a need for a test, where, what should they do? Is there a, a drive-up facility in the city of Brockton or in the region, uh, or should they give their uh, health care provider a heads up? How, how should they do that? Yeah, I mean, the first thing, Chris, and again, I want to thank you. This was really informative information from the SBA and the Chamber, and, and I know that uh, everybody that's on here, I'm getting a lot of texts while we're going through this, and everything's been really positive. Um, and again, I, I do mean this. We're in this together. I just got off a call. I, I have three calls a week with the uh, CEOs of uh, Signature uh, Brockton Hospital, Good Sam, VA Hospital in Brockton and Brockton Neighborhood Health Center, along with Father Bill's Maine Spring and High Point. Uh, and again, what the healthcare professionals are saying is if you feel sick, if you have flu like symptoms, contact your primary care physician, contact your doctor, right? That's the first one. Uh, Self isolate again, right? That's key. This isn't an extended vacation. We have to take it serious. But there is testing facilities right now. The neighborhood Health Center is doing that, signature in Good, uh, Good Sam. Uh, and, and I suspect the VA. I don't have confirmation on the VA, but there are testing facilities. But as John McGarry, who's a registered nurse in the health officer for the city of Brock, and he's been in the industry for over 40 years, you know, what he's saying is just listen to what the healthcare professionals are saying. Literally, we have to adhere to that in order to get by this. But your question was, was on point, Chris. We're hearing it. We're getting calls every day about that. Number one thing, take care of yourself. And if you don't feel well, uh, contact your doctor. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Are there questions now uh, for Eli? Yes. Thank you, Chris. So some of the questions coming in, Eli. The first question is, if you have other credit available but it isn't sufficient to cover four to six months of operating expenses, are you still eligible? Or do you, uh, need, to max out, do you need to max out that credit line? No, so uh, if you do have to use it, now uh, let me just make it clear for everybody. So we are currently uh, working on a three to four week, you know, turnaround time. But you can only imagine that, you know, as the volume comes in, that time frame is, it, you know, that timeline is only going to get longer. Okay. Now the good news there is that we've already had loans approved in Massachusetts. So that's, that's awesome. You know, I cannot, you know, stress that enough that, you know, the declaration was made on the 18th and this morning we had approved loans in Massachusetts, all right? So some will take less time than others. Um, however, it is, you know, uh, that's, that's basically, you know, uh, the current timeline on, on processing those loans. Thank you, Eli. Um, if you are a landlord of multiple properties in your personal name, are you eligible? 
So as a landlord, um, you would have to claim that income on Schedule E. So um, if you're filing 1040s and you, you are claiming the income property on Schedule E, that um, that would make you uh, eligible. So, um, so one of the slides did mention that owners of real estate properties are eligible for assistance, which is, again, another unique feature of, of this product. Our other SBA loans do not qualify for, you know, help to passive businesses, which is what an investment in real estate is. Thank you. Um, if you apply for the EIN loan, are you just eligible or will you be eligible for other loans or SBA relief that may be coming? So we've sure. seen this several times too. People are wondering if they should wait to apply for a better offer. So what I would highly recommend, and as you said, Chris, that you put in an application for the idle loan. Okay, you can always say no when it gets approved. It doesn't cost you anything. Okay, just have an ace on your back pocket. But uh, just to add to that, currently there is another program available. Okay, through the SBA's lending partners. So all SBA express lenders in the state, they can make a small working capital loan called an express bridge loan pilot program. They can make it under their own unilateral authority for up to 25 okay? So uh, that's available, that doesn't mean, it doesn't mean automatic approval either. So the big it has to be fully, you know, on board with it, and it can only be the bank that you already have a, a relationship with. So you cannot go to a new bank and get an additional, you know, funding for for under this express loan program. And that express loan program is available today, correct? Uh, yesterday it was the official launch day of it. Uh, a lot of people are still, you know, trying to, to get, you know, the, the details of that, but it's pretty basic. Um, only up working twenty five thousand, you said? Up to twenty five thousand dollars. It's working capital only. And once you get approved for an idle loan, the economic injury disaster loan, then that loan can be paid off with a uh, basically with a disaster loan. Okay, which is better terms. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank That's you. I, I'll, I will That's try really to get important point. Sorry, I'll try to get that out on the chat message. Next question, um, if they're talking about student loans and it wasn't clear whether if they have outstanding loans, which do have to be included, or if it was a loan from a long time ago. So the paper application, you know, uh, doesn't have a lot of room for you to basically elaborate uh, whether you past or recent, but the way that it asks, it says, has the business or listed owner ever had or guaranteed a federal loan or a federally guaranteed loan? So I would say yes. The answer to that should be yes. And if you can, if you have to, um, basically just add a page with explanation. And, and, you know, that brings up a very good point. So. Some businesses are unique in many ways. All of our businesses um, are unique in many ways. So if your operation has changed, if you've got a new contract, if you've got a new vendor, if you got if you lower the cost of goods sold, if you increase sales in the recent, you know, twelve months and you haven't filed your tax returns, there is absolutely no way for the loan officer to know that unless you are explicit and you fill out additional information. So blank tape doesn't hurt. Try to explain your, your operations. If you haven't filed your tax returns for 2019, right, and a lot of people have not, and a lot of people are taking advantage of, you know, the extended deadlines from the IRS. So I would highly recommend that you at least submit your financial statements, balance sheet, profit, profit and loss statement for the period ending on December 31st of 19. That will give the loan officer an idea what your operating expenses are for the previous year. 
That's a great point, too. Massachusetts just followed suit on that July 15th date, so all taxes being filed uh, for personal are due July 15th for both the state of Massachusetts now and the federal taxes. Great, thank you. Next question, is there a different application for a nonprofit? Of course. So nonprofits will fill out Form 5, uh, but the, the basically reduced paperwork um, for, for nonprofits. Uh, the, the paper application, the site has all that information, so it's, it's somewhat of an easier process for a nonprofit. Thank you. And, uh, what about venture capital? If you're part of a venture capital company, um, well, we had a question earlier in another webinar about venture capital, so more detail would be needed. Uh, the credit elsewhere test is usually an issue there. Uh, so, credit elsewhere test is it's, we're going to look at balance sheet information, we're going to look at personal financial assets. Sometimes, venture capital firms have liquidity, excess liquidity, and they may be ineligible because of credit available elsewhere. So, we're, we don't have uh, much time here. That's probably going to conclude the questions. Uh, however, we will take those questions and we'll distribute them to our partners and try to get answers and then post them on the Chamber's website. I did want to go back to one thing, and that is landlords. Uh, the City of Brockton has many uh, investors who might have uh, multiple family uh, homes, maybe two or three or four multiple families. Uh, my understanding is that uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, Congress, that they are considering including uh, them in uh, these programs uh, as they have uh, independent contractors as well for unemployment sake. So they're really trying to be comprehensive in providing relief to all known uh, businesses or organizations that they know are impacted by this. I want to once again uh, thank uh, Eli and Susan. Uh, I want to thank Margaret and Susan. Of course, I want to thank the mayor, and I want to thank all of you who are showing your Brock grit and your and your Metro South grit uh, by uh, you know rolling your sleeves up and figuring out how you can get uh, back to recovery after this COVID-19. Uh, the chamber uh, stands with you. Uh, please check out our website at metrosouthchamber.com. All of the information uh, that you've received here. Uh, will be posted there as well and can be shareable. We also are, are on all the social media channels, so again, please feel free to uh, share those links and uh, best practices and commonly asked questions. Uh, really have put together a good selection uh, of uh, items for your support uh, as we recover from this COVID-19 situation. Eli, I know you and I talked about this, and I know uh, Susan and Margaret, you've talked, you and I have talked about this, and I know the mayor's already committed to this. Uh, we'd like to have you back next week. Is that possible to kind of give us an update once Congress uh, takes their, uh, uh, their votes? I'd be happy to, and um, you know, we'll we'll just work on the logistics there. Again, I, I just want um, just want everybody to, to you know uh, to be aware that although Congress may move quickly, the agency is not going to have the details as to how we're going to deploy you know the program right away. So there may be there may be a bit of a delay. But, uh, what we're hearing from the Office of Capital Access, we've got all hands on deck. We're going to try to disseminate the information as quickly as we get it. And, um, you know, I would say perhaps later next week or early the following week would be a more appropriate time. Okay, so anybody who's registered for this today will receive a notice of that. And uh, thank you very much for committing to, to that. And uh, in, enjoy the rest of your day and, and try to get outside and do social distancing and get some exercise and some fresh air. It is springtime in New England, so thank you. All right, stay safe, everyone. Everything's transferred over.